Hello, and welcome to Keep the Channel Open. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 32. Our guest today is Ginger Shulik Porcella, who is the executive director of the San Diego Art Institute. And, um, you know, I'm always happy to get the chance to talk to people who are helping out the San Diego arts community to, you know, to grow and who are making things happen here. So talking to Ginger was a real treat for me, and we'll get to that conversation in just a minute. But first I wanted to talk a little bit about joy and stress, which, you know, well, we, why we need joy in stressful times. So tonight my kids had karate class. So after work, I went over to watch the class and then drive them home. And, you know, as we do, we were listening to music on the way back. Uh, we were listening to songs from the show Steven Universe. And the kids were in a pretty good mood because it was buddy night at karate class. So my five-year-old daughter got to come join the class for the night, which usually it's just my son who's eight. And so there we are. We're driving back listening to these songs, which we all love. And I hear my daughter's little voice coming from the back seat singing along. And for just a minute, we were singing together, just happy and singing a happy song. And it was lovely. And this is the song we were singing. Isn't it such a beautiful night? Whoa, we're underneath a thousand shining stars. Isn't it nice to find yourself somewhere different? Whoa, why don't you let yourself just be wherever you are? And it was about as perfect a moment as I can think of, just the two of us. And you know, I was thinking about this tonight as we were doing our evening routine, how stressful life has been lately, how Every day, I throw myself into the things I'm working on, which lately has been political resistance, and how every night I fall into bed with nothing left in the tank, but still feeling somehow like there's more that I should have done. And, you know, every day, something new to investigate, something new to worry about, and it starts to catch up with you after a while. You know, you can't be on a hundred forever. Eventually, you start breaking down. And so, all that is going on for me, but then there's this one beautiful, simple, perfect moment when it's just me and my little girl singing about being where you are, and God damn, but that is just what I needed right then. It's just this tiny moment of pure joy, and I can hold on to that like a piece of candy to suck on, you know, a little burst of energy that can propel me into tomorrow, and you know, you need that, I think. We all need that. And I hope you are able to find those moments in your life right now. I, I hope we all can. All right, so as I mentioned, today's guest is Ginger Shulik Porcella of the San Diego Art Institute. Uh, SDAI is a contemporary art museum here in San Diego that has recently garnered a lot of attention for its new direction under Ginger's leadership. It's really become an amazing force in the local arts community, bringing in not just visual arts exhibitions, but all kinds of interdisciplinary stuff, concerts, performance art, community interaction. It's, it's really just been cool just to get to watch it happening. So Ginger and I talked about what her role has been at SDAI, uh, how things have developed and where they're going. It was a really great conversation. One thing I want to mention before we get started is that tomorrow, as this airs tomorrow, that's Thursday, February 2nd, 2017, SDAI is partnering with the Ruben H. Fleet Science Center and Southwestern College to kick off the inaugural AMT Festival in Balboa Park here in San Diego. And let me just read this description from their website. It sounds fantastic. The inaugural AMT Festival, Art Music Technology, is a pilot initiative of the San Diego Art Institute in collaboration with the Fleet Science Center and Southwestern College to present a national festival of experimental electronic and data-driven ideas in a creative laboratory featuring cutting-edge performances, music hacking, and demos that connect artists, students, technologists, researchers, thought leaders, and businesses in a vibrant environment. Unique collaborations, new works created on site, 
premieres and demos of technology, and a visionary community will make the event an exciting and innovative landmark gathering for San Diego. AMT is cross-genre, international, enriching, and inclusive, ensuring that more than half of the participants are women and artists of color. Further, we aim to create a world-class festival and conference that is accessible to people of all ages. So, look, if you're in San Diego, in the area at all this weekend, and this you know, this sounds like a pretty amazing thing, and you will get to be a part of this festival's very first year. And the tickets are only 75 bucks for a full three-day pass, which, you know, that's a pretty amazing price considering that other similar festivals are routinely in the range of like five or even ten times that much. And, you know, they're really going out of their way to make it as accessible as possible for everyone. So come check it out if you can. All right, so now on to the show. Here's my conversation with Ginger Shulik Porcella. You're right in the middle of hanging a show right now. Yeah, right in the middle. Yeah, and it's going to be the bienni- Southern California Biennial. Southern California Baja Biennial. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I know a couple people um, who are going to be showing in that one. So um, I'm looking forward to getting yeah, to see it. Yeah, it should be a good show. Yeah. So um, I guess like where I w- wanted to start was the first thing um, – that so I've lived in San Diego for about twelve years now, not as long as a lot of people, but longer than some. Um, and so, like when I first became aware of the San Diego Art Institute was maybe like I want to say like five years ago, maybe six. Mm-hmm. And the how to put it? Like, it wasn't very good. Well. <laughs> It's it definitely had sort of a different reputation than how it's been, um, as far as I'm aware, like pretty much since you got there, and um, and I think that's been pretty amazing to see. You've been there like about two years, is that right? Almost three years. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, like, can you can you sort of talk a little bit about what your experience there has been like? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I I moved. March 2014 from New York to run the San Diego Art Institute. And before it was very much like a clubhouse for Mm -hmm. artists. So artists would essentially pay money to show their work there. Um, They were member artists. And so for me, I was trying to create a space that was much more contemporary, much more inclusive. Um, I think the community has been very supportive of me and the work that we've been doing there because I think that we're definitely having a major impact on the contemporary art scene here. Um, However, in trying to be more inclusive, there are people that certainly felt excluded when we broadened our programs and worked with um, a wider variety of artists. So, you know, it's always a vocal minority of people that are going to be upset with change, like the type of people who fear change. Like, I think change is amazing and inevitable, but... There are a lot of people who are very afraid of change, and they let me know. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was interesting. Yeah, I can imagine it. You know, like uh, when I first, um, I know there was like a community group or something that I sort of halfway joined at a, at one point that would have meetings at the museum there, mm-hmm. and um, and like everybody was really nice, but my impression of like the stuff that was getting shown there before was, was more like a community space Mm -hmm. rather than like a lot of the stuff that I've been aware of what you've been bringing in is a lot more, um, not just high profile, but like, Contemporary, yeah. if that makes does that sound yeah, about right? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I definitely, I mean, we're a contemporary art space, mm-hmm. no doubt about it. I mean, that's really our focus, which was not our focus before. We said that we were a visual arts organization, which for me is very limiting because a lot of the work that I enjoy is not primarily visual. Mm-hmm. I like uh, sound installations. I like performance art. Um, so how can we show those sorts of works if we say, oh, we only show you know, 2D visual art. And um, I do think that we're still very much a community space, but it's a different type of community. It's a, it's a community of artists that are, you know, supportive of each other. We do, you know, crit groups. Um, We have a lot of dialogues about, you know, important topics related to contemporary art practices, 
but it certainly is a different kind of community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like speaking of the, I mean, I know that there have been, um, you've, you've done like concert stuff there before I went and saw a show there. I think it was over the summer. It was three bands. Like, uh, one of them was this, uh, Swedish synth pop. Oh, band. kite. Yeah. They were great. Weren't yeah. they? That whole show was like, just really blew the roof off of the place. Oh, <laughs> and literally the, the fire alarms started going off, <laughs> which I didn't realize until like halfway, like through, cause it was, I thought it was part of the like music mm -hmm. and the light show, but it was actually the fire alarms going off because of the smoke machines. Oh, yeah. And then I just turned around and I see like, you know, firemen streaming down the staircase i was like oh i just thought this was like part of it <laughs> yeah yeah we try and show more um more bands there that's part of our mixtape series that mm -hmm. um we have local bands with international bands coming and um yeah we just try and make it a much more active dynamic multidisciplinary space than just a, a place where you can come in and look at art on the wall we want to mm -hmm. engage people through a right. variety of ways yeah it's been pretty cool watching how that space has developed over the past couple of years but um so i guess like so like where do you come from like what's your what is your background hmm um it's a it's a i have a very weird background <laughs> um i don't know how far back to go um like professionally i guess you know um you know, I have a degree in art history, but I started my career really working at a um, a research center and archives, doing um, research uh, related to exhibitions and and publications on um, contemporary U.S. history. And so I was. This was in Chicago at the Newberry Library, and it was a really fantastic place. So I came come from much more research based historical anthropological background. My master's degree is in anthropology, so. Hmm. Um, but when I moved to New York, I always worked um, in contemporary art. And I was always interested in contemporary art. My focus as an art history major was in contemporary art. Um, and I've just been lucky to always sort of work in my chosen field. So um, as a curator, you know, I started my career um, at Aperture Foundation in New York. Mm -hmm. And so really was interested in photography exhibitions. And prior to that, had been doing a lot of photojournalism in Chicago before I went to grad school. So I come from more of a photography background. And then working with photographers, I got really interested in um, sound and video art because that was actually sort of more interesting to me at times than just looking at a photograph. The, a lot of the photographers were working in video, but the thing that I latched on to the most was the sound component of those videos. So, and then I sort of fell in with a ragtag group of performance artists in New York and really got interested in um, organizing events around performance and video. And, you know, as a curator, I, I come from a much more non-traditional background. I've never really been interested in, like, putting something on the wall. I've been much more focused on events and experiences, and I think that's how I approach what we do at the San Diego Art Institute it's much more program focused. And then, oh yeah, we happen to also have an exhibition up as well. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. It's, um, like a lot of the stuff I I don't get out as much as I would like to. Me neither. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like a lot of the things that I've, uh, like openings and stuff that I've been to have like, I'll, even some of them are just like one night only if they were to the concert, obviously, but then like, uh, like a bunch of people that I've interviewed for this show, I've met through the mass attack. Mm hmm that was at San Diego Art Institute. Um, and just, I don't know, like there's something, it's such a great space. Mm -hmm. Um, the way that that place is like, it's pretty big. <laughs> it's bigger than you. It's not as big as I would like, of yeah. course. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a big enough space and, it, but it's an unexpected space because you have to like go into the basement uh -huh. in Belvoir Park. You're like, what is that? Like, oh, I'm just going to go downstairs and I want, I want people to come back all the time because they have no idea what they're going to expect because, you know, every show we do is totally different than the one before it. And I want to keep people guessing, but, you know, the quality is always going to be great, but it's going to be something unexpected every time. Mm -hmm. And you just, you don't know what you're going to see. And I like, you know, creating that sort of environment. Yeah. That is something that I've definitely noticed. It's a very sort of eclectic vibe that you've got mm -hmm. going on with all the different exhibitions and events. Um, I think the first thing I saw there, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, uh, Rebecca Webb is a friend of mine, mm -hmm. 
and she had her show there with Jesse Burke. But then, like, pretty shortly after that, there was something that was completely different. I remember when I was there for the that concert, there was a thing for it was a Balboa Park history thing or for the oh, centennial. Archaeology. Yeah. Archaeology. It's a program that we have um, with one of our artists in residence, Kate Clark. That's a collaboration with a bunch of different institutions in Balboa Park to explore the uh, dark underbelly of Balboa Park. Mm-hmm. It was pretty wild. It was, it was, I think there was something about like a, some kind of nudist colony. There was something. a nudist colony in Balboa Park. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine probably a lot of San Diegans don't know that. No, they don't, but um, we want to let them know. Yeah. 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 It's pretty wild. Now, is that, um, like I know, like one of the, it seems like one of the benefits of being in that location is that you are right there with a whole bunch of other mm-hmm. institutions, the Museum of Art, Museum of Man, the um, MOPA. Mm-hmm. Is there a lot of collaboration that happens between the different institutions? or I think more so now. I mean, just in the short time that I've been there, I mean, we really try and foster an atmosphere of collaboration, and we collaborate with a lot of different institutions. We collaborate with MOPA, the Museum of Man, um, um, the Fleet Science Center, and we have an upcoming collaboration with the Natural History Center, the NAT. Um, so we... I think that we have an interesting, we're coming from an interesting perspective that complements a lot of the programming at those different institutions. And, um, and my peers in the park have been really supportive of the work that I'm doing and, and really want to be a part of it because honestly, we're bringing in a much younger demographic than some of the other spaces in Balboa Park. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're, they're interested in seeing how they can incorporate some of that into their programming. Yeah. Yeah. That is. I don't know. There, there. It. I think it's really interesting. I think that. I'm not sure if this is. You know, my, my my background is not like super deep when it comes to, this sort of thing. But it's been my impression that maybe, in the past four or five years, that, a lot of different, um, institutions all over the place are sort of trying to think about how to engage with sort of audiences that wouldn't traditionally have been museum goers. Mm -hmm. And that seemed like, like a lot of different people are taking a lot of different strategies at that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know, like it's something that uh, like Balboa park and all of the different museums there. I mean, some of them are very like the fleet center has a lot of stuff that's very aimed at young, like kids. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But then I don't know, like the Museum of Art, even some of the stuff they've been doing more recently that seems a little more aimed at contemporary, younger stuff. It, I don't know, like, it, it, I don't know if that's something that's been super successful for them, but like what you're doing, I don't know, there's something, I don't, I don't want this to sound like, I, I can't think of a better word to use than mm-hmm. just cool, uh-huh. you know, about what's we try happening. And be cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, the programs that I develop are really, um, they're things that I would go to Uh and I have very eclectic tastes. So, I mean, we have lectures, we have screenings, we have performances, you know, we have just like weird events like, Oh, we're going to do a taxidermy event or, you know, we're going to, you know, have a zine event, like just things that engage a wide variety of audiences. And, and definitely for me, um, I want to, I want to reach out to people who wouldn't normally come in our space and we're very event focused. So Mm -hmm. most of our visitorship comes from those events. Um, you know, Monday or Tuesday through Friday, it's mostly tourists in Balboa park. And then, then our audience base totally changes over, you know, based on the events that we're doing. And Mm -hmm. I mean, even the space that, that, uh, we're in right now, our project space downtown, it's, it's an attempt to, um, engage non-museum going audiences i mean people who frequent the mall are typically not the people who frequent museums yeah so we're trying to make contemporary art accessible to them yeah and that that's another thing too like i know i was um uh talking to Chantel paul a couple of months ago and um there's i don't know there's something like the the different kinds of spaces that are popping up all over the place around here are um it's really interesting how people are sort of thinking differently about that kind of thing and i'd never heard of this space before mm-hmm. 
I got in touch with you so that we could record here. Mm -hmm. And like, I had no idea that this was even going on here. Yeah. Um, what, like, how do you, like, what's, what's the like difference really between the two spaces? Uh, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, it's a project space, so it's more, I wouldn't say it's more experimental because I think the programming that we're doing in Balboa Park is more experimental, but it's more, um, you know, we don't have to cater to a tourist audience here. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we let the artists basically program the space. So it's, it's much more artist driven. Our exhibitions are all, um, conceived by the artists that are working here. Um, we have studio space here. So, so, um, it's really about active, you know, cultural production. We have, um, workshops here for people of all ages that are really accessible and everything that we do here is free too. So anyone can come in, anyone can participate. Whereas in Balboa Park, we have admissions, you know, so mm -hmm. it's a little more formal and here it's, it's a little more informal. Yeah. And do you like, I mean, obviously it's a different, um, like physical location. Like you say, it's a mall. Like, do you notice that there is a really big difference in the people that come to the different spaces? No, I mean, <laughs> I mean, honest, not, not really. I mean, we thought, um, that there would be, and it was sort of an, you know, it was going to be an interesting experiment to sort of see what sort of crossover there was. It's our audiences that are coming here too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a really great dedicated audience base that is coming for, I mean, it doesn't matter where we do something, they're going to come to it. We could do something on the you know street corner in city Heights and we'll have people coming to it because they know that they're going to see something, you know, different and unique. So, I feel like the attendance here has been really fantastic. Um, and I wasn't quite sure. And now that people know where we are and, you know, they've been coming, um, it's hard to find, um, anything in Horton Plaza. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, you know, I think we have a pretty decent location that's more visible than, you know, being in the middle of the mall. So it's been interesting. Yeah. Now, so like you were just mentioning that you have sort of this like very dedicated audience of people, like, sounds like regulars, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so how does that like, I don't know if, I don't even know if this is something you necessarily think about as, as a director and a curator, but like sort of like, if you know, you have this dedicated core of people who are going to show up to stuff, but then also like you want to have, I assume like, you know, reaching towards people that are outside of that group as well. Like how does that yeah. kind of well, this last year we doubled our attendance. So clearly people are coming and are interested in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And we're already, you know, halfway through this fiscal year doing better than last year's attendance. So mm -hmm. we're continuing to grow and our organization, not only through attendance, but, um, you know, our staff is growing, our programs are growing, our finances are growing. We're, I feel very lucky that I'm in a situation that we're, growing where many other organizations are not in that position. Um, but you know, we're 75 years old and I think a lot of people have been wanting, they've seen the potential of the organization and they're mm -hmm. excited to see that we're finally tapping into that potential after, you know, decades. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, we just have to keep trying new things. And I think that you can't be afraid to take risks because with, taking risks come really great successes. You will fail sometimes. Some things that we do are a massive failure and we just don't do them again. And some things, um, are wildly successful. Some things are moderately successful, but to just, um, you know, keep trying new things and have fun with it. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty, the, the, the amount of just even how much word of mouth I've heard over the past two years compared to the previous like, I mean, like I say, so five or six years that I've known about the space, mm -hmm. like the difference in how much buzz there seems to be, even to the point where I'm hearing about it. Mm -hmm. Um, it's pretty impressive. Thanks. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I mentioned, I, I talked to Chantel Paul, you know, fairly recently. Um, and, and it, it, this was something I sort of brought up with her as well, but that it seems like, like a couple of things. One, like, um, I've felt for a while now that the San Diego art scene in general, it seems like it's like right on the precipice of just jumping off and becoming like just really blowing up um, because it's always been kind of an undersized scene for how big the city is. 
um, especially when you compare it to some place like San Francisco is way smaller, but has such a, a much more established scene there. And on t- and then, like part of that has seemed to me that like, I mean, there's a lot of different factors that I've been seeing going on, but like one really solid part of it has seemed like there's this sort of um, new cadre of younger directors and curators that has started sort of around the same time. I feel like, like you and her sort of started around the same time getting, you know, to be in charge of stuff. Um, but all of that is really added up to something that seems like really exciting stuff is happening. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a lot of potential here, much more so than I had even anticipated when I moved here. I knew nothing about, you know, the San Diego art scene, um, moving here from New York. And I think for, you know, for me, I I keep saying, oh, it's a small town. It's a small town. I just learned that it's like the eighth largest city in the United States, which is shocking to me because it It doesn't feel like that. It feels, it feels like a really small town, you know, whereas San Francisco seems much bigger. Boston seems much bigger. These are places that are much more culturally vibrant. Yet I feel like San Diego is perfectly positioned to be a successful art center. Like, yes, um, there's not really a commercial art scene here, but Mm -hmm. I think that artists are, are better positioned to make experimental work because they're not creating work for the market. Like they are in New York or Los Angeles. Um, artists can make bigger work, um, just because of the space here. And, you know, I think that San Diego is perfectly positioned between Los Angeles and Mexico. I think there's something really interesting happening. And, um, and a lot of the work that we're trying to do is, you know, further that dialogue and, and to get people to, to realize that great art's being made here, not just, you know, regionally, but nationally and internationally. And Mm -hmm. a lot of our programs are directed towards bringing national and international recognition to this specific area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember one of the first people I talked to for this show, I think he was like the second or third episode uh, um, that I have this uh, cousin of mine or my dad's that lives up in LA. And we were talking about, particularly about the Southern California art scene and, and like he's based in LA, but has a fair amount of awareness here. And his sort of thought was going forward that you were going to see more, um, like here, especially seeing that influence of Mexico and that there's a really big art scene booming in Tijuana right now. Mm -hmm. And then also he thought that there would be a fair amount, at least on the collecting side, if, if not also the, um, um, sort of art making side that um you'd see a lot of stuff like happening sort of trans pacific kind of things I oh absolutely i mean i yeah we're on the pacific rim i mean there's no reason that there shouldn't be more um dialogue i mean we live in a very global society i mean you can live anywhere now and be a successful artist just because of you know technology um, you don't have to live in New York or Los Angeles or Mexico City or Berlin to be successful anymore. Um, and I think that's a really great thing. I, I don't think five years ago or, you know, however long ago I would have left New York and moved to San Diego would have been like the death of my career. But I feel like I can be here and do something that I know is is making a real difference um, with this art scene in this particular region. And even in the short time that I've been here, when I first started going to Los Angeles, people were like, oh, San Diego, like, is there art in San Diego? <laughs> and now people really know about what's happening here. Even in New York, when I go visit New York, people know what's happening here because we're really working hard to get people to understand that there's a recognizable art scene happening here. And um, and a lot of what we do is collaborations with, with LA and TJ. And um, I mean, that's really our geographic focus, Southern California, Baja. So like all, almost all of our exhibitions are based, but uh, our focus on artists living and working between Los Angeles and Tijuana. Yeah. That was something that um, I, I don't think, I don't know if I ever read the mission statement mm-hmm. before you arrived and like before the new website, but um, <clears throat> I was looking at it the other day just to sort of prep for this. And I was really interested to note that, um, that, the it specifically talked about that sort of cross border thing um representing artists here and in in Tijuana and Mexico um and that's something that uh I mean obviously like right where we are in San Diego is really appropriate but um also just seems 
I don't know. There's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like that's our biggest resource in San Diego. Like it was just shocking to me when I moved here and I would talk to people who had uh, lived here for like 30 years and like, Oh yeah, I haven't been to TJ in like 30 years. And that was like, for me, the equivalent of saying like, Oh, I live in Manhattan, but I've never been to new, I haven't been to New Jersey for like 30 years. (laughs) So, um, which I had, I heard all the time. Like there's people who like never left Brooklyn or never left Manhattan. It happens. But Um, you know, I made it a real focus of mine to spend time in Mexico. A lot of the artists that we work with live in TJ and, you know, it's, it's a totally different lifestyle. It's, it's more affordable to live there. You can be, you know, experimental there. You don't have the same sort of limitations put on your artwork. And, you know, for me, I just feel like it'd be, it would be so weird to ignore that huge, um, such a huge area where artists are not just artists, you know, it's a really culturally vibrant city in terms of, um, food and wine and, um, you know, the museums and galleries there. So it's, it feels like Brooklyn to me. It reminds (laughs) me of home. I mean, like San Diego was really bizarre for me to move to. And then I went to TJ. I was like, Oh no, this is, this feels like New York, you know? So it's nice to be able to go visit there and, and get that sort of, uh, urban density, that feeling of you know people doing stuff you yeah know? <laughs> i think there's sort of a weird sort of psychological distance that a lot of even people that are from here have with the border like it, like it really is really close but it doesn't feel close to a lot of the people that live here it seems like i don't know it's very strange mm-hmm. um so uh the first place we met was was at uh, the medium festival and um you were participating there as a portfolio reviewer um and i'm i was sort of curious like when when you're i'm sure that when you're finding new work that you have a lot of different avenues for for that kind of thing but i was kind of curious like how the portfolio review experience that's something like a festival like that specifically especially like something that's very specifically photography oriented Mm -hmm. i don't even know if they do things like that with other they do. Oh, of course they do. Yeah, I've done lots of portfolio reviews. Like nationally, um, I've, I, I feel really comfortable helping people in that sort of format. I mean, for me, it's it's a two way street. I want to learn about new artists. I want to see new work, and I try and make sure that there's at least one nugget of helpful information I can give to people. Some people have lots of things I can help them with other people. It's like, I don't, you know, it's hard because my aesthetic is, is, um, across the board and there's some people whose work is not quite developed and, um, you know, but you don't want to crush their spirit as an artist because they're tell you emerging. What, some reviewers have no problem with that. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to be that person. <laughs> I, I genuinely like personally and professionally want to help artists be better. And so like there were some artists I met were like, super they were super they were just starting out and for me it was like okay how can i best help them i mean they needed help with like just getting a website up or Mm -hmm. you know just you know editing their work you know um getting a business card you know like starting from that and then there's other artists who are super established and making great work and you know it's it's a totally different level of conversation so just trying to to gauge where people are at and see how i can help them in that specific place in their career you Mm -hmm. know yeah. I don't want to make anyone cry. <laughs> so, I've <laughs> definitely seen people crying in reviews before. I know. I saw some and I was like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, this this particular year, it felt like at least the people that I was talking to, it seemed like mostly went well this year. And mm-hmm. I wasn't sure whether it was because the reviewers were just in a better mood or if just because the level of work just happened to be higher this year, or maybe it was just the people I was talking to. I don't, I don't know. know. I, you know, I, cause I did it the year before as well. And I don't remember one year's quality being better than the other. Cause you know, you don't know who you're going to get as a reviewer, mm-hmm. you know? So there was a lot of artists whose work I didn't get to see. Um, but you know, for me, I just want to, I want to encourage artists who are just starting out in their career. If the artists are more established, like if they're showing in museums and galleries, they can take a really tough critique and Mm -hmm. I can tell who those artists are. And I will be tough, much tougher with those artists because they know when something's not working. They just need someone to, to, you know, give them that extra push. Whereas a artist who's just starting out, who may not be making good work at all. If I tell them their work sucks, that's going to like crush their spirit. And 
and they're just going to give up. And I don't, I don't necessarily want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, th- there's always sort of a give and take to, I mean, some, some artists I know can approach those situations very sort of like, what are you going to do for me? Kind of thing. I don't know. It, I, I, it's, it, I get a little irritated sometimes with stuff like that. Mm-hmm. When you're reviewing, or I guess even not just re- like doing portfolio reviews, but just in general, like if you're when as a curator, like what what are you looking for? You know, what catches your eye usually? That and you is said a you had a really taste, diff- but- difficult question. Yeah, because I mean, I had always been primarily known as a curator of time based media, and and it's not a label that I necessarily want to have because. I feel like it is very limiting. Um, so, you know, I'm also interested in like contemporary craft and, you know, installation work. And if it's good, it's good. I th- feel like work needs to be saying something about the world that we live in. It needs to be um, conceptually interesting yet physically well made. Mm-hmm. I see a lot of work that's like, oh, the concept's there, but it wasn't well executed. Or, wow, like your craftsmanship's great, but I'm bored. Mm-hmm. Like, Neither of those things are particularly a great situation to be in. Like, preferably the work is well made. It's saying something new that I haven't like seen before. It's doing something in a in a unique way. Um, but it's really hard to pinpoint because that could be so many different mediums. Like, I see a lot of bad video. I see a lot of bad photography. I've you know the the medium that's always been most difficult for me to to connect with his painting and mm-hmm. most curators like they get painting like mm-hmm. for me it's like okay it's oil on canvas it's two-dimensional what are you saying so it's it's always been so much harder for me to connect with a painting than anything else because it's like okay yeah it looks good yeah and then i don't really know what else to say about it so yeah. like i could never do a painting portfolio review because i would just be like great job <laughs> it looks well painted i don't you know i don't know yeah yeah. Well, and it's an interesting thing too, because like, I think what a lot of people sometimes fail to realize is that like curators are people too, <laughs> and oh, everybody yeah. has their own tastes and, you know, their own lens with, through which they yeah. are viewing these things. Well, I mean, and that's why like for things like our artists in residence program, um, I make sure that I put a panel of people together to help me select the work because I know that my tastes are quite different than the majority of people's tastes mm-hmm. and I don't want my personal aesthetic to always be the only dialogue that we're having. I think it's really important to bring in other voices to, to supplement my ideas. And, and certainly I collaborate with the staff on a lot of our programming. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, and when we're organizing our exhibitions, we're really deliberate to make sure that we're not doing a bunch of academic shows or, you know, maybe there's something that's more pop culture than more academic, you know. So it's it's always this balancing act of trying to create shows that are interesting that aren't like the show before it, but like, oh, we haven't shown a photography show for, you know, a year. maybe we should do something with photography or, you know, it's always trying to figure out something different that we can be saying to people. Yeah. Cool. So for the second segment, I always ask the guests to bring a topic of their own. So just to be able to let you have some say in the direction of the conversation. So what would you like to talk about today? So the thing that I would like to talk about today are, um, conspiracy theories. Mm. <laughs> That's certainly pretty topical right now. Yeah. Is it? I mean, there's, <laughs> depending on, uh, on who you talk to. Yeah. There's a lot of that kind of stuff going around all over the internet. Politically. Right now. Yeah. Politically. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, I've just always liked the idea of conspiracy theories, especially pre internet. You know, I feel like it was so much, it was a different, like we live in a, a sort of post internet society where conspiracy theories are spread in a totally different way than they were before the internet. So Mm -hmm. I like thinking about these conspiracy theories that existed and how they were perpetuated before the internet existed, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, what's your favorite one? Uh, Oh, there's so many. Well, the reason that I've been, I've been really spending a lot of time with conspiracy theories lately is because we're, the San Diego Art Institute is launching a conspiracy theory podcast oh. in January that is, uh, conspiracy theories linked to San Diego. So all San Diego linked conspiracy theories. Wow. So, um, you know, San Diego is a place, um, 
where there's been lots of cult activity. Mm-hmm. I've always been really interested in cults. Um, you know, Unarius is still here in El Cajon, and they're really interesting. Um, they have. Do you know much about Unarius? I do not. Oh, they're great. I mean, anyone can visit them. They um, all believe that they're descendants from these philosophers, but they're also all artists. Hmm. So if you ask nicely, they'll let you into the back where they'll show you their artwork, which I've always wanted to exhibit um, in some sort of way, which hmm. may be in the works. Um and every year they have this annual jubilee where they like release these doves from a spaceship because they all believe that they're like it's like a, it's an alien cult so mm-hmm. it's like i like aliens i like cult and that one merges um the two together very nicely and then you know heaven's gate was in san diego as yeah. well which is a very well known um again you Uf- well not ufo but you know based on the hail bop comet and yeah. uh we're trying to track down this person who allegedly um served the members of heaven's gate their last meal Whoa. at marie calendars they all ordered chicken pot pie i mean i guess if you're gonna go to marie calendars that's that's what you get yeah <laughs> so <laughs> the chicken pot pie <clears throat> and uh the guy um the ancient aliens guy giorgio do you watch ancient aliens i at don't know oh, it's so good so um he's like a very popular like internet meme but he mm. lives in san diego like wow. the ancient aliens guy so we've been trying to get him as well and there's um an artist that i'll uh hear that i'll remain that will remain anonymous who actually grew up in a cult mm. and who will be sharing his story with us um anonymously um, there's also a lot of balboa park sort of conspiracy theories and like ghost stories and hauntings and stuff like that apparently the carousel in Balboa Park, all the the hair on the horses is actual horse hair. Hmm. That was um, came from horses that were slaughtered in Balboa Park. Huh. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there's a lot of uh, interesting um, information. And also a lot of, like, UFO sightings in, in San Diego. Um, a lot of unsolved crimes in San Diego. Hmm. Um, yeah, so, and a lot of these are, are sort of linked together in some interesting ways. Yeah, that is really interesting. It's sort of like, it, and it, and it's one of these things where you kind of, there's some kind of intersection of all of these things, you know, where there's something they all kind of have in common, some way that they sort of speak to the human psyche. I don't know. It, it's fascinating stuff. totally and we've been trying to like categorize all of these different things i've been working on this with lisa corona she's our education director um into different categories but a lot of them really interlink like a lot of the cults linked to the ufos and they link to you know some of these like weird military conspiracies and um you know i, I really got into this because um a few years ago i was free i don't i think it came out a few years ago there was this article in vice um, that maybe you've read about the Berenstein versus Berenstain oh, yeah. bear conspiracy. Yeah. So are you a Berenstain bear or Berenstain bear? Berenstain. Okay. No, it's the Berenstain bears. Like <laughs> it's totally the Berenstain bears, but the whole idea that like, Oh, we live in these alternate realities. There's like the pre Berenstain world. It's like, sort of like a butterfly effect. Mm-hmm. Like something happened and then the Berensteins became the Berenstains. And I'm one of these people that, if I read something, I remember it forever. I just have a really great memory. And I had all of the Berenstein Bear books. Hmm. So for anyone who says it's Berenstein, I'm like, no, it, it, there's, it can't be. Yet, every book says Berenstein. Like, I can, I get that, but something happened in the space-time <laughs> continuum to change it to Berenstein. Yeah, I, that, that, I saw that. I don't know when it was. I don't think it was that long ago, but. Yeah, it came I, out like three years ago or something. Yeah, it might have come back around again this year, earlier this year or something, because I remember my Twitter feed sort of blowing up about it, and I wasn't on Twitter that much before this year. So, um, yeah, it must have come back around. But, but uh, yeah, people definitely were losing their shit over that. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to get some people from Vice to sort of facilitate a Berenstein versus Berenstain debate. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that'll be fun. All of all of these discussions that we're going to have on the podcast, we're also going to have live events too associated with them. So we're having a launch party at the end of January that'll feature um, 
uh, so a friend of mine here, Al Jones, he's a he's a well known sound artist and sound engineer. And he actually um, is in the military. He's a, a sonar engineer on submarines, hmm. um, but you know does a lot of experimental music and composing. So he received in the mail. Um, maybe two months ago, this letter, like an anonymous handwritten letter linking um, linking Hitchcock's The Birds to JFK's assassination. Hmm. And so it's really w- bizarre and weird. And so Lisa Corona, who I'm doing this podcast with, she's also a video and performance artist. She's creating um, this video piece, sort of um, mixing together... Um, Hitchcock's The Birds and JFK's assassination and a little um, Lee Harvey Oswald action um, that will be shown with a live score by Al Jones and then um, sort of a reading by an AI of this letter. Mm. So it's sort of this whole um, basically commissioning this new piece, this new conspiracy theory piece to launch the event. So that should be interesting. I just like bizarre stuff like that, like the unexplained. Like, why did he get this letter? Who did it mm. come from? We don't know. But you read the letter and you're like, okay, this guy has some interesting... Ca- He's clearly crazy, but he has some <laughs> interesting points, you know? Yeah. I think it's interesting, you know, like when you're talking about San Diego based things, I'm just sort of thinking about the area and how um, you have all of these different sort of cultures mixing here. I mean, obviously you have the United States-Mexico border, but then also there's like a a uh, military community here that is fairly well established, but then you also have all these people coming in from other places, and many of whom are sort of only marginally aware of the history of the area. Even though, like, like a lot of West Coast places, I feel like um, San Diego has, like, really sort of wears its history on its sleeve thing if you're willing to take a, take notice of it. Um, but it it seems like that would be a really sort of ripe condition having all of these things intersecting and then sort of the wild west stuff mm-hmm. you know um back when this was a fairly small community um to be able to have those stories first come up and then also per- be perpetuated is is this seems like fertile ground totally yeah it's a weird place where um you know when i first moved here like i got like the first 2 weeks everywhere i went people tried to convert me and I'd never experienced that before. Um, so this, like, you know, this conservative, conservative, conservatism of like religion and politics, but also a very liberal sort of place. It's like, you know, sort of the red dot in the blue state, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, but yeah, everywhere I went, people tried to to convert me, and eventually, you know, I was driving in. A, car with a new york license plate i said you know like clearly i'm either like jewish or atheist like don't (laughs) i'm from new york i'm jewish or atheist or neither but you know it was it was just really interesting that people were so you know like the first day i moved here i went to a restaurant and the server tried to convert me the sir i was like just give me my lunch you know like (laughs) i don't want to go to church i just want to eat a sandwich you know so that's kind of weird. And you don't I've lived like here 12 years and that's never happened. Really? Me. Yeah. Although I, I will say that we get a lot more, um, door to door proselytizers here than anywhere else I've ever lived. Mm-hmm. Um, I've lived in California my whole life yeah. and, uh, that is not something that I'm used to. It, it was, it was not fun, you know? And then I don't, I, I just don't know what about me says like, Oh, she needs to be converted, you know? Um, but I'd never experienced that in New York. It was really, hmm. you know, sort of bizarre. People like they wouldn't do that in New York. It's been, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's like a lot of cultural differences. Like the, it's it's been interesting for me. I've lived in like sort of three different sort of major areas of California. I grew up on the Central Coast, sort of near Monterey, and then I lived in Orange County for about four or five years right after college, and then before moving down here. And each one has like a totally different culture Mm -hmm. it's funny that like like as far as conservatism goes like orange county is like way redder than here yeah but it's like a totally different flavor too where like Mm -hmm. orange county is like wall street conservatives more and like san diego is more like army conservatives Mm -hmm. um but uh yeah i don't know there's something there is definitely something I, i feel like 
a lot of the people who have like families that have been here a long time and like military families and that like you have that conservatism there. Whereas the people who are moving here and have been here like maybe less than 20 years are more sort of blue state type people and yeah. like seeing how that mixes and plays out in like our local politics and stuff is pretty interesting. Yeah. And I think it'll continue to change as well. I mean, as I mentioned before, I mean, we live in a much more globalized society and people, you know, even when I came here three years ago, I got a lot of crap from about being from New York. Like, Oh, I'm, you know, crazy because I'm from New York. And it's like most of my friends here are from New York and I just see more and more people moving here. And, um, and it's like, you know, more people, more people will continue moving here and more mm -hmm. young people will continue moving here. And, and why not? You know, it's happening not just here, but all over. And I always kind of joke like San Diego's the town that like the seventies forgot. Like it feels like a town that was like built in the seventies and then like nothing happened for a while. Um, just like based on the architecture and sort of the mentality of things. But I do see it, it changing a lot now, you know, it's sort of like, a the DMV of towns, you know, like people still ask me to fax things here. I'm like, you know, I could just scan it and email to you. They're like, no, just fax it. So mm -hmm. it's like, I have to have a fax machine here, which is just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that, that is actually a pretty astute observation. Like, um, like I live in Mira Mesa and like all of that place was built in basic from like 1970 to 79, more or less. And there's a few newer parks, but like a big chunk of it was like, and I feel like a lot of the places sort of outside the like center core of San Diego are like real seventies and then stuff sort of stopped. And then all of a sudden, even just in the time that I've lived here, now you see a lot of new development, new stuff happening, old neighborhoods sort of transitioning into something else. And nobody quite knows exactly what's happening. Yeah. But, um, I mean, I, th I mean, even just in the context of stuff that we were talking about before, um, with the art scene really taking out, like, I think that there's like just a ton of stuff happening here right now. And it is like a super interesting time to be here. Yeah. I think for, for a city of its size, like San Diego has a lot of different art scenes, you mm -hmm. know, like there's, and, and I'm not going to say any one art scene is more valid than the other, but there's, there's a lot of different pockets of things happening. And for me, it was really important to make sure that I create a space where, you know, we could be the hub of all these different things that are happening and sort of, you know, bring them together. I always say like, oh, our aesthetic is, you know, UCSD meets Barrio Logan. And I think that that's sort of what we're aiming for. It's like, you know, academic, but it can be sort of lowbrow and goofy and, you know, it's accessible and, you know, and not just one note. It's not the same thing. And I see some art, you know, little pockets that's like, oh, like that just looked like the show before that and the show before that and the mm -hmm. show before that. And, you know, we want to do a little bit of everything. And, you know, and I think it's reflective of the diverse nature of San Diego. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've just seen so I, I, I feel like it's a rapidly changing city just because in three years I've seen it change so much. So it'll be interesting to see how it continues to develop, you know. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see what new conspiracy theories happen as well. It seems like yeah. rapid change is like yeah. a perfect thing to engender new yeah. stories. Yeah. Um, you know, like I live in Lemon Grove and um, and I keep hearing it from everyone's like, oh, Lemon Grove is like the next the next big place. I'm like, Lemon Grove? Like, okay. Um, but there's a lot of people that are actively trying to do a lot of public art in Lemon Grove and are trying to build like artist housing in Lemon Grove. And, um, you know, the reason that I moved there from New York was because, um, it was like the most diverse place to live in San Diego. And it was really weird going to a lot of different communities where it was like, you know, like, Oh, I'm, I'm white moving to the white neighborhood. Like mm -hmm. people were like, Oh, like you'll probably move to North park. Like, why would I want to move to North park after like living in Brooklyn? Like that's not going to happen. Like, and, and it's so different living out there too, because it's like quiet. I have space, you know. My dogs can run around, and and you know they love it. And yeah, yeah. So. It's sort <laughs> of a weird. It's the thing that I remember when we moved here from from Orange County. Um, that my wife and I would talk about how like you'd go from from like not even that far away from you know like one mile to the next, and you can be feel like you're in a totally different city. Totally. 
um, which was on the one hand something that we really liked about the place, that there is so, like, you didn't have to go very far in order to have a completely different cultural experience. And I still think that's something that's very, like, it's like very a, neighborhoody. Yeah, I think that's something that's like a valid thing to like about San Diego. But like one of the things I've been thinking about a little more recently is how also it kind of feels a little segregated. Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. or actually extremely segregated. Extremely segregated. <laughs> and that was, it was really shocking to my husband and I. And that's literally why we moved to Lemon Grove because, it, I mean, I just, I can't even, like, it was really weird to go everywhere. We're like, oh, wow, it's so white in San Diego. It was really scary for us, actually. And we were like, what did we get ourselves into? You know, like, New York is such an international city. It's like our friends are from all over the world. And that's what I love about New York is that, you know, we're all, you know, together. And San Diego just seemed really segregated to me. Yeah. And um, and I didn't like that. So that's why I moved to Lemon Grove. And it's, it's much more diverse place to live and yeah. we like that yeah it'll be interesting to see how oh geez with the you know current political climate like i feel like um san diego has this really interesting thing where like i say like you have this different mix of like liberalism and conservatism but also like different cultures coming together and i don't know like we could definitely go in a couple of different directions right now mm-hmm. and hopefully we take the good one yeah um golly i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah uh <laughs> it's a little bigger <laughs> than this podcast maybe i just went all somber yeah oh my goodness um well uh i don't know maybe that's kind of a downer note to end on but, uh, <laughs> but anyway. that sounds about right for me <laughs> just leave them on a down note yeah um, um no I, I mean but i really do appreciate your time. I had a good time talking to you. Thank you. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about before we go? No, I, I've really enjoyed, you know, getting to know you more and talking with you as well. So, so thanks for inviting me. Yeah. The last thing that I ask everybody is, is if there's some piece of art or literature th- um, that you've seen recently that has mattered to you. It's so hard for me. The only thing I can ever think about is the most recent thing I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. So, or read. Uh, I just finished reading. I, I'm a big sci-fi uh, fan. And cool, I just me too. Finished reading this interesting book called Mirror to the Sky, which mm. is from like the early '90s, but it. Uh, basically it was about aliens who came to alien artists <laughs> who came to the earth and um, created work that was, um, you know, reflective of their society, but also really revealed a lot of truths about the universe. But the art was the most important thing to this, this society and they needed that art or they couldn't go on. And so it was, it was interesting because it was like sci-fi, but it was really, a lot of the work, uh, the book was about the art world and mm. it was interesting to sort of merge my two interests, sci-fi and art. Um, and I would definitely recommend it. It was just a really sort of bizarre. Who's it by? Um, uh, I, I can't remember who it was by. It's just like a random, like, you know, paperback sci-fi mm-hmm. thing. Great cover, which is why I always get the sci-fi, uh, you know, novels. And the thing is, um, you know, living in Lemon Grove, the Lemon Grove Public Library every weekend, I think most most days, but on the weekends they have a book sale and they have the best sci-fi collection. So mm-hmm. I always go there and like get like five like cheesy paperback novels and just go through them. But it was one of the better ones that I've read in in a while. So, cool. yeah, check it out. Cool. All right. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Okay, so as I mentioned at the top of the show, the AMT Festival opens tomorrow, Thursday, February 2nd, and a full three-day pass is just $75 with individual event admissions as low as $10, so you definitely don't want to miss that. There's a link in the show notes to the AMT Festival website, so please do check that out. And that is our show. If you'd like to get in touch with me about anything from today's show, you can email me at podcast at keepthechannelopen.com, or you can find me and the show on Twitter at channelopenpod, or on Facebook at facebook.com slash keepthechannelopen. If you'd like to help out the show, you can leave a review on iTunes, and there's a link in the show notes for that. Another way that you can help out the show is that we have a Patreon campaign, which you can find at patreon.com slash sake river. That's sake like the drink and river like river. 
And if you're able to make a pledge, any amount is a great help and is greatly appreciated. You can subscribe to the podcast via iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast app. Our theme music is by Poddington Bear. You can find more of his music available for licensing at soundofpicture.com. Next time, our guest will be poet and podcaster Jose Olivares, so please be sure to come back for that one. Until then, remember, keep the channel open.